Welcome to Doc Talk Live. Gary, good to have you back. This is Gary Bullock. Um, Gary uh, came on a few months ago. We talked about ADHD, and um, and today our goal, I don't know if we'll get to it, is to talk about the diagnostic process. I believe uh, one of our listeners uh, to Doc Talk Live uh, wrote in and asked, hey, can, can we do something about how one goes about diagnosing ADHD? And we talked about it last time about putting me through right. mm -hmm. the battery of tests. However, I do have a list of things that I wrote down that I want to, that I want to sort of check out with you about okay. ADHD. And, and, and one is, is, is we had a, um, we had a, a viewer uh, type in, they saw the um, the show that I did on uh, the anti-inflammatory diet, which I found fascinating mm -hmm. and very interesting. But for him, it was like watching paint dry. Oh yeah. Um, but but he he took the time to say, hey, look, I really want the information. Right. Okay. But I don't want to spend thirty minutes getting it. Gotcha. And uh, and I thought that was reasonable. Oh yeah. I'm kind of like that too. It's yeah. like, all right, get to the point already, you know, and right. and. But, but is that my ADHD kicking in? And, and with that said, too, maybe at the end, if you could post a summary no of the key things, like we'll come back at the end and say, okay, these are kind of the key things we found out today, but even maybe type in something later on that we can post on Doc Talk Live that, that, that will allow people to, to get um, a flavor without having to watch so much. Sure. Now, if you're seeing this live, I appreciate it. And if you have questions and we're live, by all means, pop those in now. But but I could relate to his comment. Right. I didn't like the comment, but I certainly could relate to it. Right. And, and is that is that a sign of ADHD if I'm like that all the time? Okay, so that's hard for me to gauge because I was diagnosed as a resident. All I know is that when I go online to find a video about how to change the oil in my car, I'm just automatically going to tap the forward arrow about six times to get past their intro. Um, so maybe it is. I know one of the biggest keys to ADHD generalization wise is we lack a built-in pause. Uh, our brains just tend to react to the environment um, by default, uh, which is great if you're in a battle and there's bullets flying, but not so great if you're in a conversation with somebody you care about and you gotta present some kind of truth to them that's not very comfortable. You wanna have that pause built in and listen to that voice in your head that tells you what not to do. So I can't just draw it out of you? Yeah, there's, no, there's no fast forward button on that painful conversation. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, also the iPhone. Um, I, you know, I think that, that, that I, I never thought of myself as having ADHD personally, mm -hmm. but now that I have this device that, that can, can keep me occupied 24 hours a day, right? While, or anytime while I'm awake, it's like, and you see everybody, the whole world is looking at their iPhone. You know, you go into the airport, you go on the airplane, everybody's looking yeah. at looking down at their yeah. iPhone. We're totally engaged and we totally want to be distracted all the time. I'm curious what you think about that. I want your comments. Sure, yeah. Okay, so I'll give you more on this, but for my uh, bottom line brother out there who's like skip skip the fluff, get to the meat part of this. Uh, there's a cultural anthropologist, Simon Sinek, who's a great author. Well, you don't have to talk fast because they'll never get it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So the best uh, information on the iPhone culture and is it causing more ADD? Is it causing more false diagnoses of ADHD because we're training our kids to not have an attention span? He's got the best presentation of that um, somewhere on YouTube if you just put in Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, and cell phones. Um, he's got a pretty good um, treatment of that issue. By and large, it's not causing ADD, and it's not creating a false diagnosis of ADD, but it is definitely amplifying those who have ADD. It will become much more prevalent because ADHD is about the distribution of dopamine, the go-get it kind of um, neurotransmitter. And if I'm bored by math, but every time I get a like on my Facebook page, a little more dopamine, I'm gonna be all in on my cell phone. Especially if the real people in my life aren't very receptive to me and maybe Maybe I'm not a likable person, but on Facebook or whatever, my false persona is out there, and it's not really me, but people like what I'm presenting, and kind of slip into that false reality. So what are some of the, the non-pharmacologic 
treatments that that um, you recommend to people for ADHD? Like like a lot of people don't like the Ritalin and the Adderall right. and the way those drugs make you feel. What are the non pharmacologic uh, things gotcha. that you can do? That's a huge huge part of this. And if you're kind of wanting more information about ADHD in general, this is a level one question. This is a massive and important question. Uh, Peter Jensen did the research on this back in the 90s, and it, it literally took a decade to do thousands of patients with ADHD to say behavioral modification, which is an extra layer of specific disciplines on top of what everybody has to know growing up. Like everybody needs to brush your teeth and make your bed. With ADHD, okay, make a bed, brush your teeth, and write everything down, and have a system of getting your homework assignments so that when you get home, you don't go, oh, we didn't have any homework in math. No, it's written down. Um, so keep a list, is that what you're saying? Things like that. So it, we can go into more detail, but the behavioral modification training is the, the things that we should learn progressively to do in addition to what average people do to keep our, our memory intact and keep the little bits and pieces of the day from getting too scattered and disorganized. So that research shows that without medicine, behavioral modification creates such an improvement in development of somebody with ADHD that it'd be negligent not to push behavioral modification. And then they studied medicine alone, and it was shown to be so helpful, it'd be cruel to not use medicine versus nothing. But both together were so additionally, like one plus one equals four, Kind of uh, helpful. So there's a synergistic effect, Big is what point. you're saying. Right. And then, and then my last question before I get to the diagnostic piece, before we find out how ADHD I am, um, is uh, this thing about depression and ADHD and other right. mental illness and ADHD, and and how would you wrap that up, or are they linked? Are they unlinked? How, how do you how do you mm. tease that out? Okay, so. The status on that question is it's complicated. The simple explanation is a lot of people fear, well, if, if somebody's just flippantly diagnosed with ADHD, well, how do we know they're not depressed? And because of their depression, they're distracted by being uh, introspective and distracted by the, the troubles inside, the, their unresolved conflicts, whatnot, and which could be. Uh, that, I suppose that happens a good bit. And then anxiety, for people who have an anxiety disorder, that's gonna be distracting and just preoccupy their mind so that they uh, would seem distracted. On the other hand, people with ADHD, as they mature, will develop more and more hypervigilance because they're kind of getting yelled at for stuff they didn't see blindsiding them. And you get that kind of a frustration-based hypervigilant anxiety, and then the depression symptoms will be there, but it's not really depression, and the person will search for a word to describe it, and I'll say, is it more like a long-term massive frustration? And they'll say, yes. I'm pretty optimistic, but I'm so frustrated. Every time I lose the keys, every time I lose my pencil, it just makes me feel like a moron. And so they get that kind of self-esteem dilemma. A quick way to know the difference between is it depression looking like ADHD or is it ADHD looking like anxiety and depression? Um, there's a lot behind this, but the round pen were on the table. And as you're watching TV, the pen was to, on peripheral vision, roll off the table. If it's more depression than ADHD, you'll just kind of watch the pen fall to the floor and go, I kind of sympathize with the pen. If I had the courage, I'd jump too. If it's ADHD, you'll kind of peripherally notice it falling off the table. And before you can even look directly at it, you'll grab it on its way down because you have heightened uh, reflexes instead of a restricted uh, neuromuscular responses. Fair enough. All right, let's talk about diagnosis. I think you. Uh, on your computer, you had some questions maybe to run through. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So to keep this from being like the paint drying metaphor, um, okay. nutshell version, ADHD is not diagnosed by a checklist. It's not diagnosed by how many yellow crayons you're eating in kindergarten. Not diagnosed by how many times you're late or forgetting your keys or phone. That could be from a lot of different uh, issues that aren't even medical. What you're looking for is an overall picture of a person who, despite their best efforts, despite the discipline, despite the sticky notes, still has significant dysfunction that family members and coworkers have noticed and feel strongly that they should do something about. Hey, you're a great guy, but. Hey, you're a wonderful employee, but. And uh, so what we do is we, we 
contextualize everything about the diagnosis in what we call a structured clinical interview, which is every doctor who treats ADHD or diagnoses it will approach this maybe in a different style, but there's certain bases we have to hit to get a full picture. Um, so before I bring it down to the nutshell, it's not just a list. There are lists involved, but it's not dependent on that list. So yeah, if you look at the screening test online, that's a good start, but have somebody tease it apart because there are some options and some complications that on rare occasion can masquerade as ADHD and you don't want to be on the medicine for that. Okay, so while you, you're gonna yep. fire up your computer, any questions out there? Not yet. Not yet. Any listeners out there, Seth? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm on. All right. Good. So, if you're out there and you want to look at this online, since uh, I don't really have the audiovisual for this, it's the Adult Self Rating Scale, the ASRS, and it's public domain, so you can get it online. Just punch in Adult Self Rating Scale for ADHD, and any number of sites will pop up with the same form since it's copyrighted and it's for public use. The first part is a screening test. If you get four out of those six that are in the gray box zones, okay. you need somebody to talk to you about the ADHD. You might want to sit down again, Seth. You want to sit here? Okay. You good, Seth? All right. All right, so where do we go? All right, so as we're talking, now we get the story from you. I was okay. saying, hey, what's been going on? What's troubling Should you? Should I look at that or not? You'll actually fill this out before you come okay. up to see me. Most of us right. will have patients fill out the forms okay. beforehand. All right. But the hallmarks would be after I get an idea of what's going on and kind of rule out some generalities. Um, we'll go over the the test, and you already filled this out. You would check never, rarely, sometimes, often, or very often. Okay. And you see how there's you know, gray over here and white over here. So the gray ones are going to be different for the different questions, but those are the ones, the number of boxes checked there. Well, so so maybe I should have filled this out before we started. Is that what you're, you're saying? Well... If I didn't have ADD, you probably would have. But <laughs> All right. You, you get what you pay for. All right. The thing we're looking for is, and you don't have to keep a scorecard out there, it's just five or more in either the impulsive questions or the um, distractible questions. Both are in there. If you have five or more of either, it's going to be ADHD if not proven to be something Should else. Should we go through a few of these questions? Sure. Or okay, not? so just to give you some examples, we may not go through all 18 for the sake of time. Uh, how the first ones are really key. How often do you have trouble wrapping up the final details of a project once the challenging parts have been done? Rarely. So do you like painting the walls of the room with a big roller brush and dread the trim paint? I dread the whole thing. Right. Okay. So that would be one. Um, you want to do some home improvement project because you just watched a 30 minute TV show where they revamped the whole backyard with an editor. But I'm pretty good at calling somebody. So, okay, so, so calling is not a problem. Yeah, I'm right. not. I'm not a good home improvement guy. Okay. Right. But that Which, doesn't mean I have ADHD. It just means that I don't do those things. But it shows that you solved the problem. Uh, but I, I'm a problem solver. Okay. okay. Um, Next. How how often do you have trouble getting the fine details of a project together when you have a task that requires such organization? And we're talking about the things that are mundane, necessary, and boring. So, do you have your tax forms? Do you have your receipts? Do you have all that stuff? And yeah, you, I'm pretty you, good about that stuff. Do you dread tasks like that? No, or are you pretty comfortable with them. No, I don't dread them. I mean, okay. it, it once I have the organization down, then I'm good. It's just getting, it's, it's how to organize it. Sometimes that's challenging for me. But once I have the organizational piece down, how and, and it's organized, then I can follow the the method. You know. Okay, here's one of those hooks that's really important to the diagnosis for an adult with ADHD because we're no longer chewing crayons and jumping up and down in the chair. We're adults. Have you always been that way with organizational tasks? Yes. Before the age of 12, did you ever struggle strongly? With I probably tasks? struggled when I was 12. Absolutely when I was 12. But I don't, I don't struggle now. So. Okay. So that may have been something that might be ADHD, but behavioral modification unknown to you was actually occurring. All right. So when you have a task that requires a lot of thought, how often do you avoid or delay getting started? So how bad a monster is procrastination? I'm not a procrastinator. Okay. No. Uh, how often do you fidget and squirm with your hands and feet when you have to sit down for a long time? Probably do that. I don't know. Sometimes to often. Yelled at in med school for bouncing my knee during a test. No, not me. By a fellow student. No, that was me. Okay. Should have known. All right, so how often do you feel overly active, compelled to do things like you were driven by a motor? Uh, very often. 
Yeah, it's kind of an unfair question in our culture because none of us would have gone through med school if we weren't that way. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to stay active. Right. And some would say if, if you're in a context of life as an adult that is made for that, like somebody in the military or a pilot or... Uh, but physician. that's a problem. I mean, that's like my solution to, to things. That's right. like, it's, it's to occupy my time. Running to stand still. Kind yes. Of idea. Yes. All right, which may be a... It's a trait that's not dysfunctional for you, but may help us clarify that this might be somebody with the genetics for ADHD. The next right here, I'll go through real fast. How often do you have, or do you make careless mistakes and working on something that's boring and difficult? Never. How often do you have uh, difficulty keeping your attention when you're doing boring or repetitive work? I'm pretty good at that. Not too bad. How often do you have difficulty concentrating on what people say to you, even when they're speaking to you directly? I'm sorry, what'd you say? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which, we're trained, at least during the daylight hours, to pay attention to no matter what I'm saying. Um, yes, I would say I, that can be frequent. Yeah. And when your paycheck depends on it, probably not, but after hours when your brain's tired, for sure. Oh. Um, how's your day to day here? That's a hard one. Okay, so how can you misplace uh, the bits and pieces that you carry with you? Work cell phone, keys. Never, never. Pen. Okay. Very rarely. Before the age of twelve, same. No, I wasn't. I didn't lose things. So. Organized kid. Yeah. Good. How often are you distracted by activity or noise around you? No, not really. You never get grumpy when people cut them off. In the I get grumpy. I'm <laughs> grumpy, but that's because people are going too slow. Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> that might be a trait too. Okay. Any questions out there? Can you save me, Seth? <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> I read that 70% of all addicts are once diagnosed with ADHD as children. Is there a connection between ADHD and addiction? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So think about it. If you're born with a brain that was geared to pay more attention to things that are very life and death or, or um, attention provoking and less so to things that are necessary but dull, that's mediated by a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And you can get dopamine from a lot of different sources. A heavy workout, you see endorphins, and then you feel great afterwards, which sounds weird. Why feel great after running a lot voluntarily? Then some people get that dopamine rush for doing something that's a challenging task that served other people, and they got a good rush from that. Well, pain medicine does that too. Uh, opiates do that too. Opiates are known to push dopamine out there. You'll see people with restless leg on pain medicine after surgery, and suddenly they don't have a restless leg anymore. And then when the pain medicines run its course, have a hard time sleeping for two weeks as they readjust to not being on an opiate pain reliever. So a huge connection is like an undertow. So people born with a genetics for ADHD, when they're treated, statistically when they're treated, their risk of addiction goes down exponentially. If they're not treated, the risk of addiction to anything, whether it's drugs or gambling, goes up exponentially. It's a huge connection. Okay, there. Okay, good. Thank you for asking that awesome question. question. If there's any other questions, please keep them coming. All right, should we Continue with our. Uh, yeah, we'll wrap so far, this. it's looking pretty good, right? For me, I mean, I don't know. Not I see the check marks. Okay. And wait, that's not all. There's two other factors on this. We okay. have to get someone from work and someone from a home context to scale okay. you on these as well. Okay. Good. That's good. All right. Because in my mind, I'm not ADD at all, but two people at home, two people at work. Gotcha. Maybe not so much. All right. So, um, how often do you leave your seat in meetings or situations which you're expected to remain seated? Mm, probably more than I should. I'm going to refill the large Coke in the middle of the movie just to get up. <laughs> All right, so um, how often do you feel restless or fidgety? I would say often. Okay. There's a tie into this. If you, have, if you think you have ADHD and you wonder, well, I've always been complimented on my work ethic. That's usually a trade. It's hard to find somebody with adult ADHD who doesn't have a reputation for working twice as hard as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it may be tied into this restless uh, nervous system. How often do you have difficulty unwinding or relaxing when you have time to yourself? Oh, uh, often. So yeah. What do you do? What do you do when you have time off? How do you, how do you relax? Uh, I like to play sports. Tennis? Tennis. Yeah. Tennis. I don't know how I knew that. Oh. <laughs> There's your clue. All right, Tennis, so hockey. Squash. If your way of relaxing is hockey, then maybe yeah. something besides ADD. <laughs> maybe post-concussive. All right, so um, how often do you find yourself talking too much when you're in a social situation? Mm, I don't think so. But I guess you got to ask other people. 
<laughs> and then if you're if you're doing this test along with us, you'd have to say, okay, is that a trait I have I learned to control myself after becoming an adult? Was that that way when I was 12 or younger? Because we're looking for consistency over time, not just some. Yeah, but I'm consistent. sure when I was 12 or younger, I was much worse. Could be. Yeah. Um, Inappropriate, impolite, rude. Um, and you're not a surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> Interrupting. I don't know. Okay, so, well, that's our last ones here. Um, in a conversation, how, how often do you find yourself finishing the sentences of other people you're talking to before they can finish them themselves? I tried to finish that one, but I couldn't do it. So Right, <laughs> and then there's this uh, intuition is pretty strong people with ADHD, so we kind of know what people are going to say anyway, mm -hmm. most of the time, it seems. Uh, how often do you have difficulty waiting your turn in situations where you're in line, etc.? How often do you interrupt others when they're busy? So you can see there's a mix of questions, and not everybody's going to be positive for every one. Sure, it's a, it's a range, and it's, it is a, a, range. it's a feel. Mm -hmm. And I guess I guess for ADHD to really be something you want to treat, it's got to it's got to it's got to somehow functionally impair your life. Right, it's got to be significant. Okay. Any more questions out there? That's so far. Okay, good. good. So so Gary, how do people? You're in Hoover, right? Your right. office is in mm -hmm. Hoover, and. And how do they find you online? Okay, so the website is drgarybullock.com. That's doctor with a dr, garybullock.com. Uh, I know we tried to hook up your uh, Facebook page and questions people have. It'd be easier if they have questions for me just to go to my website, and then there's the email posted there and the phone number. Um, I, I've got all kinds of time to answer whatever questions people have. All right, let's 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 do our summary. Okay. So if you're watching the rebroadcast, you can just Fast forward to the end, okay? What's our summary? So ADD affects a lot of adults. Diagnosing it is pretty simple and easy and straightforward, but can be complicated, and it's gotta be done by somebody who knows what they're looking for. It's not so obvious in its presentation compared to childhood ADHD, so no matter what the approach of the clinician is, it has to hit certain guidelines and kind of all bases have to be rounded before the diagnosis can be made. And then that screening form, if people wanted to look in line and do a little screen on their own, would be what? The adult self-rating scale, the ASRS. Um, if you have more than four out of the first six that are in the gray areas, you would you wouldn't be wasting your time to seek a more full diagnostic process. Awesome, pleasure as always, yeah, Gary. Yeah, same here. Thank you. Uh, certainly, you know, if if we can continue to to, to attack this concept in, in ways that are educational and informative, you know I'm all for that. Okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks Seth for doing Thanks, that. Seth. Yes.